Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Thurma Fisher International Workshop on Prenatal Screening. Normally, at this time of year, I'm sure you would be looking forward to meeting all together in Berlin as part of the normal PNS Forum. But obviously, because of the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic over the last year, meeting together has not been possible. We hope that moving forward with many vaccine rollout programs across in many countries across the world, that the prospect of a meeting again in Berlin in 2022 is a real possibility. Today's webinar will focus on first trimester preeclampsia screening, and we have four 15-minute presentations from key opinion leaders, followed by a 15-minute question and answer session. In order for you to, to, to get the most out of these sessions, I will explain a little bit about the platform we are using. Your screen should look something like this current slide, at the bottom of which you have a series of engagement bars, <coughs> engagement tools. And by clicking on these tools, you can bring up a specific screen related to that tool. The first tool that you will see here highlighted is the media player. And in this window, you will see the current speaker displayed. There are multiple uh, <coughs> application engagement tools you can use at the bottom of your screen. And all the engagement tools are resizable and movable. And if you click on the slide area to view, you will see the current speaker slides. We are also offering simultaneous audio translation in Russian, Spanish, and French, and details of how to use these functions are provided from the audio translation tool. For the Q&A sessions, we, we ask you at any time during the webinar to ask questions addressed to the speakers in writing via the Q&A management tool. We will select as many of your questions as possible to be answered by the experts. But if we have questions still left unanswered, we will provide all participants with a written answer to these questions from our experts. And these will be emailed to all of you a couple of days after the end of the webinar. We are also recording the whole of the webinar session and the Q&A session. And the link to a downloadable copy will be emailed to you within a few days after the webinar finishes. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth in intensive, so closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headsets are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. So let's move on to the beginning of our presentations for today. Our first speaker is Professor Leona Poon from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. To any of you that have followed the preeclampsia research over the literature over the past decade, the work of Leona will be well known to you all. She graduated in medicine from the University of London and subsequently undertook a three-year Fetal Medicine Foundation trainee fellowship with Professor Nicolaides. And her work on establishing a major screening program for the early detection of preeclampsia led to her doctorate of medicine. She followed a further training program in fetal medicine at Imperial College and King's College. And now she's a clinical professor in, in a Chinese university in Hong Kong. Leonie will describe the implementation of preeclampsia screening in Hong Kong. So Leona, the platform is yours. 
Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak to you all and it's a great opportunity for me to share our experience. First of all, here are my disclosures. All of you are familiar with these two professional recommendations that utilize a risk scoring approach for preeclampsia screening. If a woman has one high risk factor or two or more moderate risk factors, then she's considered high risk and is advised to take 75 milligrams or 81 milligrams of aspirin from 12 weeks till the birth of the baby. At my hospital, previously, we were also using a similar approach for the screening of preeclampsia. Though this method is simple, but its predictive value is limited, achieving only 30% and 39% detection rates for all and preterm preeclampsia, respectively. Another issue is that such an approach to screening has led to a rather poor uptake for aspirin prophylaxis, as shown in one of our studies, that only 23% of high-risk women had aspirin prophylaxis. This figure is even lower in Canada as 7%. It was clear that we needed to improve the method of screening for preeclampsia, and through years of research, we have developed the first trimester combined test of maternal factors, usual notch Doppler, mean arterial pressure, and serum placental growth factor that achieves excellent prediction for early onset preeclampsia with a detection rate of 90% at a false positive rate of 10%. The detection rate for preterm preeclampsia is a little bit less at 75%, as for term preeclampsia, the model can only achieve 45% detection rate. Many of you have asked me if the FMF prediction model works elsewhere. I would like to draw your attention to several key factors that could affect the screening performance of a prediction model. The first point relates to the disease itself, the prevalence as well as the characteristics of the populations. The second point relates to biomarker variations such as physiologic variation as observed in the measurement of blood pressure. So we recommend not to use a single measurement as part of the prediction model. Instrument variability as observed in the measurement of placental growth factor, inter and intra-observer variability as observed in the measurement of uterine artery Doppler. So it is critical to be compliant with well-defined measurement protocols. When I came back to the uh, when I came back to Hong Kong five years ago, I was told that my prediction model did not work. I was keen to find out the reasons behind it, so I systematically evaluated each screening component, and we conducted the study to determine intersonographers, uh, intersampling site, uterine artery PI differences, and their effect on detection rate for early preeclampsia. So, uterine artery PI measurements were performed by two sonographers. One was um, one was me, and the other is an accredited fetal medicine specialist. Sonographer A uh, measured uterine artery PI at the level of the internal os and subsequently at one, two, and three centimeters away from the os. And sonographer B measured uterine artery PI at the level of the internal os. And it was very clear that um, sonographer B uh, was measuring at two centimeters away from the internal os. So this shift led to a drop in the PI measured, and this could have reduced the detection rate by 8%. So the conclusion from this study was that the measurement of uterine artery PI is something site dependent with potential for significant intersonographer differences despite the, ver despite the availability of a prescriptive measurement protocol. After the study, we retrained everyone in the department. We were then curious to find out if the FMF prediction model works in Asia because the population here is so different from Europe. In this study, we aimed to evaluate first trimester screening for preterm preeclampsia in several Asian populations. It was a prospective, non-intervention, multi-center study. Eligible women with single-term pregnancies attending for their routine hospital visit at 11 to 13 weeks of gestation were recruited from 11 centers across seven regions. We recorded maternal factors, measured mean arterial pressure, uterine artery PI, and placental growth factor according to the standardized protocols. Briefly, here's the protocol for the measurement. Oh, jump back. Briefly, here is the measurement protocol for the measurement of uterine artery PI. And I think the key here is to recognize the anatomy, fixing the probe in the midline and gently tilting the probe to the side of the cervix slowly will allow you to see the uterine artery at the level of the internal os easily. You can scan this QR code for a more detailed description. 
And here is the protocol for the measurement of mean arterial pressure. We advocate for the measurement of blood pressure in both arms simultaneously, so it's not time consuming, but you must ensure correct posture of the woman. You can again scan this QR code here for a more detailed description. It is very important to comply with these well-established protocols for the measurement of bar markers in order to maintain good screening performance. Before we evaluated the screening performance of the FMF triple test in Asia, we wanted to evaluate the applicability of the European derived biomarker MUM formula and perform a quality assurance assessment of the biomarker measurements. In this study, we utilized two assessment tools. The first was the target plot and the second was the QSIM test. You can see here are the target plots of the three biomarkers. The different symbols represent different recruiting sites and each one represents 100 measurement per site. On the left, you can see that the MAP mums were well within the 10% of the expected median and standard deviations. But the MAP tended to be lower in uh, Asian women, as you can see a shift to the left. In the middle, you can see that the majority of the uterine artery PI mums were well within the box of 10% limit of expected median and standard deviations. And on the right, you can see that the PLGF um, and mum shifts uh, to the left, except for one site. Here you can see uh, the QSIM plots of the three bar markers. On the left, you can see that the MAP mums consistently shifted down. And as for the uterine artery PI mums, except one site, the values were well within the limits. And for PLGF mums, the values consistently shifted down except for one site. This paper has demonstrated that other than for quality assessment, the target and QSIM plots can also be used to, to evaluate variations of bar marker mum values in comparison with European data. Here I show you the scatter plots of the mum values of the three bar markers against gestational age at delivery with preeclampsia. Uh, there are two regression lines as shown. The blue ones represent the relationship of mum values of bar markers against gestational age at delivery in cases of preeclampsia from the Fetal Medicine Foundation, whilst the pink ones represent our cases. Our regression line for MAP was steeper than that of the FMF, whilst the opposite was true for uterine artery PI. As for POGF, the regression lines from both series were similar, suggesting that POGF would perform equally well in both populations. In the Asian study, calibration of risks for preeclampsia were generally good, with the area under the curve of 0.85 and calibration slope of 0.869, which is close to one. An example, the observed uh, incidence of preeclampsia was consistent with the predicted one, meaning that when you give a predicted risk of 1 in 100, then the observed incidence should be close to 1 in 100 as well. And here are the results of our uh, validation study. In a total, we screened over 10,000 cases and the incidence of preterm preeclampsia was 0.7%. And fixing the false positive rate at 10%, the detection rate was 62%. And fixing the false positive rate at 20%, the detection rate was 75%. So we compared our results against uh, the data uh, of the FMF, and we can see marked differences in, in the screening performance um, according to racial groups. And if we only focus on the East Asians um, within the FMF study, then actually our data uh, was very comparable to that of the FMF uh, results. We were also very curious to find out whether the, the NICE and ACOG would fare very well in our population. So we did a head-to-head -head comparison. And you can see that uh, by comparing the FMF triple test against ACOG and fixing the false positive rate at 20%, the, the FMF triple test achieved a much better detection rate compared to ACOG. And this is also the case for NICE. So conclusion from this study was that the FMF triple test is superior to ACOC and NICE recommendations. In clinical medicine, number needed to screen is a tool for measuring screening benefit. According to the ASPRAE data, the number needed to screen to prevent one case of all preterm and early preeclampsia are 143, 250, and 400. The number needed to screen for preterm preeclampsia is equivalent to the number needed to screen for the prevention of one case of early infection due to GBS through universal screening at 35 to 37 weeks of gestation. And compared to screening tools in clinical oncology, this number is much lower than the number needed to screen for the prevention of any cancer listed on the left. So moving on, I want to touch on prevention as well. 
I'm sure almost all of you are familiar with the aspirin trial, which has demonstrated that by giving aspirin at 150 milligrams nightly from 11 to 14 weeks to high-risk women identified by the FMF combined screening, the rate of early and preterm preeclampsia can be substantially reduced by 80 and 60% respectively. With regard to the number needed to treat, to prevent one case of preterm preeclampsia, we have to treat 38 high-risk cases, and this number increases to 69 when our focus is on early preeclampsia. As for preventing small babies, the number needed to treat range from, uh, ranges from 16 to 30. For preventing perinatal death, the number needed to treat is 34. So these numbers are very respectable. Last year, um, our screening and prevention approach was endorsed by FIGO. So at my hospital, we embarked on implementing the screen and prevent program. Here I show you patient trail for preeclampsia screening at my unit and we have actually set up in a, in a corner uh, of our observation room so that we can measure blood pressure in both arms simultaneously just sharing how our report uh, would look like you can see that we can generate individualized uh, normal charts for the three bar markers for each woman and thanks to Dalgit and his lab in issuing these reports. So it, this is very helpful when we are um, counseling our patients because um, you can tell how the biomarkers uh, behave and that will make them realize um, the, the, the implication of the risk and will be more likely to be compliant with aspirin prophylaxis. As I mentioned, we have already prospectively implemented the screen and prevent program. And during the initial phase, we did not review the estimated risk. I'm first of all very pleased to say that low-risk women has a very low risk of early preeclampsia, 0.1%, while the high-risk woman's risk for early preeclampsia is increased by 17 folds. We have also learned that despite um, the high-risk status, actually there's still a substantial number of women who would decline aspirin prophylaxis. So I'm always curious to find out how this number would be if we are offering aspirin to all women as a universal prevention program. When you're planning to implement the first trimester screen and prevent program for preeclampsia, I think these are your considerations. First of all, I'm very lucky because within my setting, there is already an established program for uh, Down syndrome screening. And therefore, it is easy for me to piggyback preeclampsia screening on top of Down syndrome screening. So the implementation process has been really easy and streamlined. And I think it's important to recognize your, the background risk based on maternal factors in your population and learning about whether the, the actually local practices adherence to any guidelines of screening and prevention of preeclampsia. And there should be a process of standardized protocols for the measurement of bar markers. Training, quality assurance process, and potential differences in values of biological parameters should be recognized and established. And you need to work at the logistics of implementing a screen and prevent program. And you need to actually have a process of pre and post test counseling. And, uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge um, um, limitations of resources. And uh, perhaps at the beginning, you might not be able to uh, uh, implement uh, the full combined test. You might be able to implement a part of the combined test. And, and, um, and as for uh, preparations of aspirin tablets, in our setting, we have 80 milligrams. So we are giving 160 milligrams. Uh, as as prophylaxis. And, you know, in, in Malaysia, I have learned that they've only got 300 milligrams. So actually, they have to half the tablet is much better than giving a quarter of the aspirin tablet. So I've run through our experience very, very quickly, and I hope you have found this informative. I'm happy to take questions at the end of, of this workshop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Liana. Uh, quite a comprehensive uh, description in a short space of time of, uh, of a really, really interesting program. Uh, I know it's quite late in the day for you, but I hope you'll stay with us until the end and answer some questions later on. Uh, for the rest of the audience, uh, please continue to, uh, throughout the presentations, to add your questions through the Q&A management tool um, I'm sure Leona's presentation will have raised lots and lots of uh, implementation questions, and we'll take all of those uh, at, at the end. Our next speaker um, 
is uh, Dr. Safwan Hamidi from the Human Fertility Research Group at INSERM. Uh, Safwan also works in the Central Laboratory of the University Hospital of Toulouse. And Safwan will talk about laboratory perspectives and the implementation of pre-cancer screening in Toulouse. Uh, Safwan, the platform is yours. Thank you for this kind uh, introduction. Well, uh, I would like also to thank the organizer for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor to give a talk at the PNS Forum. Uh, greetings to all of you from Toulouse in the southwest of, uh, of France. I will briefly present our experience of preeclampsia screening from a laboratory perspective. This is a slide of a disclosure statement. And, uh, First, a few words about our, our institution. Our maternity hospital is a level three one specialized in high risk pregnancy. It has um, a first trimester screening center and an in utero therapy center as well as a neonatal intensive care unit. In 2019, more than, more than 5,000 deliveries was, uh, were registered and around 45% of the women who gave birth here were nulliparous. Our lab is uh, specialized in several fields of laboratory medicine and has a certification for prenatal and neonatal screenings. To give you an insight of its size, we perform around 6 million essays each year. We have been convicting Down syndrome and uh, preeclampsia screening since October 2016 and uh, with respectively 1,700 and 500 files by year. We also performed the slit one PLGF ratio and recently published several papers about it, but it's not the point of today. Before we go further, I just want to remind you the setting of preeclampsia screening in France. Uh, it's not yet recommended and uh, prescribing aspirin during pregnancy is framed by a professional consensus published in 2013. And uh, as you can see on the slide, aspirin should be prescribed to pregnant women with a, a history of early preeclampsia and or a fetal growth restriction of vascular origin below the fifth percentile. So in Toulouse, um, we are conducting, conducting the preeclampsia screening under the umbrella of a, a clinical study named DROP. Um, it was conceived and correctly led by the professor Christophe Vissier. The main goal of this study is to investigate whether the combination of preeclampsia uh, screening and aspirin treatment has an effect on the prevalence of deliveries before 34 weeks of gestation for preeclampsia and or FGR. This screening is not universal, but targeted. It focuses on nulliparous women, parous women with a new partner or with an history of preeclampsia, FGR, autoimmune disease or renal diseases. Now, let me present you briefly the glob global implementation of the screening in our hospital. When a woman, when a woman sorry, comes at the maternity for a visit between 11 and four, 14 weeks of gestation, if she is eligible and if she agrees, she is enrolled in the study. Then a serum sample is collected and sent to the lab. The TPI and um, uh, arterial pressure are measured by, uh, by, uh, by clinicians according to the FMF recommendations. Her maternal risk factors are collected and overall data are recorded in their electronic, uh, electronic file. In the lab, we perform PAPE and PLGF assays. We pick up the previous data and transfer them to our laboratory release. We calculate the risk of preterm preeclampsia using the fast screen soft and we send it back through the network to the obstetrician. So they decide what to do and inform the pregnant woman of their, her own risk. I would like now to focus on the implementation in the lab. We have a five days week working session from eight to four. We measure PAPE and PLGF concentration of serum samples with the CASI Plus machine, and we calculate the preeclampsia risk with the fast screen soft version 3.0. Both of them, machine and, and soft, are connected to the lease. We deliver the results within two to five days with mainly biomarker concentration, their moms, the risk of preterm eclampsia with a cutoff of 100, and a summary of the maternal characteristics. We also store serum samples for research purposes. 
Regarding our quality assurance system, we are following the specification of the ISO 15189 standard. We use three levels of internal quality controls twice a day. Twice a day sorry. We are involved in several external quality assessment schemes for PAPE. We use those for Down syndrome screening, a national scheme, so Probiocal, and an international one, uh, Ucaniquas. For the PLGF, we participate to two international schemes, Ucaniquas and Instant. The study is still in progress, but we went through the data and I can give you some details. During the last four years, we have screened in 2,330 women with a median gestational age of 12.7 weeks. The screen positive rate increased each year to reach in 2020 around 20%. We are analyzing the, the, these results. Let us focus on the nulliparous women of the screened population and analyze their characteristics. We can see that the screened positive women are older. They also um, have, um, there is also a higher proportion of Afro-Caribbean women. The BMI is higher and of anti-rest smoking women seem to have a lower risk in our population. Regarding um, the conception, the, that of um, that the conception, sorry, by IVF is more frequent in the screen positive population. Regarding medical histories, diabetes is one of the more prevalent. Now, regarding measured biophysical and biochemical markers, as expected, we found that UTPI and MIP moms are significantly higher in the screen positive population. PAPE and PLGF moms are significantly lower in this population at respectively 0 0.7 and 0 0.6 to compare to 0 0.9 and 1 for PLGF mom. As you know, for a screening process, a major, a major point is the monitoring of moms. I show you on this slide those of PAPE and PLGF that we have obtained in the last two years the median of most GF was on 2020, respectively of 0 0.99 and 1.12, which is quite good. Let us move to the analytical performances. But before I remind you the biomarker concentration that we obtained in our population, around 3,000 units for PAPE, the screen positive population, and uh, between 25, 30, and, and below for PLGF in this population. So here are the analytical CVs for, bio, for both biomarkers obtained from IQC. Please notice that for PAPE, measured concentration in our population match with those of intermediate and high level. And for PLGF, the measured concentrations in both screen positive and screen negative population fit with those of the lowest level of IQC. This is important. So the corresponding CVs for PAPE are quite good and very good, uh, under, it's under 2%. Those, um, the, CV, the corresponding CV for PLGF at the low level is higher, around 6%. Now, regarding the rel relative, uh, relative bias calculated from the EQ EQA schemes, um, our results were most of the time good, but there are some issues. Provided specimens did not allow us to estimate the bias for every level for every year. For example, for PAPA, we could not calculate the bias for the highest level. For PLGF, the lower level is around 40 picogram. This concentration fits with that of the screen negative population, but not for that of the screen negative one. We could estimate some, some, but not all measurement ascertainings by combining IQC and EQI data. For PAPA, for example, uh, that of intermediate level is quite good, between five and seven percent. For PLGF, the uncertainty seems to be higher. We need to confirm it, and uh, of importance, we wonder what could be its impact on preeclampsia risk calculation.
So lastly, which improvements could be introduced in the analytical setting? We need to know for accuracy, we need to know what could be the analytical CV around 20 picogram of PHGF? It's a, it's a low concentration that fit with, the, with that of uh, the, screen neg the screen positive population. For EQI schemes, we need more specimens with lower concentration, below 30 picograms by milliliter. It may be useful also to compare not only concentrations, but moms of uh, PAPA and PHGF and calculated peer risks between users. And finally, we have to answer to this question. Can we set analytical performance goals for PLGF for an optimal preeclampsia risk calculation? It could be a challenge for the next years. In conclusion, um, we can say that implementing preeclampsia screening is not so difficult for a lab that is already performing the syndrome screening. However, this implementation relies on an efficient process of data exchange with the GenOps uh, department, a strong quality assurance system within the lab, a close monitoring of moms and concentrations, and a well-trained staff. And finally, I would like to emphasize um, that we have here in Toulouse a strong experience of, of preeclampsia screening. We are available for joining or building with colleagues a research consortium in the field. And uh, to finish, I would like, of course, to, to thank people um, uh, um, my colleagues uh, at the lab, Dr. Marie-Sophie Combis and Dr. Anne-Lise Genoux, our student in statistics, Elodie Prunier, all the staff and, uh, and the team of technicians and secretaries. In the GenOps department, Professor Christophe Vessier, Professor Olivier Parent, Dr. Paul Garby and their staff. And of course, the France uh, term official staff, Alison, Pascal, Emilie, Benedict, and of course, Anou, Pascaline, and a uh, special thank for Catherine with the, for her precious help for the, the PNS preparation. Thank you, everyone, for if, thank you for your attention, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, Safran, and uh, I really appreciate your last slide. Uh, screening is around collaboration between many, many individuals, and without that collaboration and the strength of the collaboration, then screening is not done very effectively. So, enjoyed your presentation very, very much. Thank you very much, Safran. Thank you again. Thank I, you. Uh, Remind people that uh, you know, we, we do uh, want to have a Q&A session uh, afterwards. So if you do have questions for any of the speakers, uh, please uh, log those onto the system as soon as you can so we can get those sorted out uh, for the, uh, the very end of the session. Our third speaker is uh, Professor Kahit Bidir. Uh, Kahit is a head of obstetrics and prenatal medicine at the Women's Clinic in the University of Dresden. Uh, Kahit graduated in medicine from uh, Istanbul and was previously a research fellow at King's in London, mentored by uh, Professor Nicolaides. Uh, Kahit will discuss some health economic aspects and the screening implementation in Dresden. So, Kahit, uh, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Kevin and uh, Catherine, for the nice invitation. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to give a talk today. And uh, I would like to uh, explain you in the next uh, following 15 minutes uh, how did we implement uh, the screening for preeclampsia uh, in Dresden and in Germany. I don't have any conflict of interests. I would like to start with uh, talking about the screening for preeclampsia. As you all know, uh, to be able to, to perform a screening for preeclampsia, we need the a priori risk, which is for preeclampsia, the maternal history, and using some uh, uh, strong biomarkers and biophysical markers, we can adapt this uh, a priori risk and uh, calculate a posterior risk, which means the patient-specific risk calculation in that particular pregnancy. And uh, we know that in the maternal history, uh, as we do for all patients, we need to ask a couple of questions. And uh, there are so many questions that are very relevant to preeclampsia. For example, the weight of the patient, BMI, and their obstetrical history, if they had preeclampsia before, the, all these factors are increasing the a priori risk of this particular patient. We use the uh, 
measurement of uh, uterine arteries and uh, we do uh, measure the blood pressure of the patient uh, as biophysical markers and uh, we do combine this risk calculation with uh, the maternal serum PAPE and PLGF levels at first trimester to have a proper screening. And uh, the detection rate was already validated uh, since years that we do know that the performance is very good. And uh, the early onset preeclampsia before 34 weeks of pregnancy can be detected up to 90%. And uh, this uh, test or the, or the screening works also for uh, preeclampsia before 37 weeks, which has a detection rate of about 75%. But for all preeclampsia, the detection get, rate gets lower, especially for preeclampsia after 37 weeks of pregnancy. And as you all know, in 2017, the ASPRESH study was completed, and uh, it has been shown that if the high-risk group takes aspirin until 36 weeks of pregnancy, we can prevent a preeclampsia before 34 weeks of pregnancy up to 82%. This particular screening and uh, the prevention uh, method is already known in all Europe uh, as long as I know. And we did test it in our unit and especially in many German university hospitals. And we did have the more or less the same levels of uh, uh, detection rates and prevention rates. So it was for us uh, clear that this test would work in Germany as well. And, uh, to start with, we did implement the test in our unit, first of all. In uh, our hospital, we have an OSCAR clinic. That means all women having a first trimester screening are having a pregnancy screening as well since many years. So we do a combined screening, and it's not just for Down syndrome or other trisomies. We do perform the pregnancy screening for all these patients as well. The cutoff value is, I do believe, uh, uh, up to the clinic and the person, and our cutoff is 1 in 150. Uh, of, after performing more than 1,000 uh, uh, screenings, we did see that this cutoff works very well in our unit, and uh, the patients having high risk with this cutoff are offered to take aspirin 150 milligrams orally, uh, in the evenings, starting from that day until 36 weeks of pregnancy. And we do have an OSCAR clinic, which I'm very proud of, uh, which means that the patient comes, we do draw the blood, and the results are coming in about 45 minutes. And uh, since uh, we do need to scan the patient and do the blood pressure measurements as well, until the time that we are ready, uh, the lab results are there and we can combine and uh, calculate the posterior risk and talk on the same day to the patients and offer them the aspirin and uh, tell them the reasons why are we offering this uh, therapy as well. When we talk about the prevention and screening for preeclampsia, I do believe that we should not forget about the fetal growth restriction as well, because these uh, screening modalities has shown that it has an effect on a growth restriction as well to prevent or screen. And a big study, again, from the group of uh, Professor Nicolaitis from FMF London has shown that a screening for fetal growth restriction is also possible, especially for the uh, diagnosis before the 32 weeks of pregnancy, up to 73%. And I do believe that this is very important because the same group of Professor Nicolaitis has offered in 2011 to turn the pyramid of the care, meaning that we need to offer a big screening uh, in about 12 weeks of pregnancy to every woman that they can have a, a screening to see if they have a high risk for chromosomal abnormalities, preeclampsia, diabetes, fetal growth restriction, and so on. And uh, I did already uh, publish about this uh, idea that we do need to start a, a screening for preeclampsia, uh, and we do it, but I really uh, hope that this will be done uh, worldwide and in many, many clinics, and it should be implemented. And uh, we, I, do, I do believe that it really works and uh, it should uh, be a main concern for many, many clinics. 
But I was starting uh, to think like, how can we implement it? It's not just implementing to say that, okay, I am using it, I'm doing it in my clinic, it works and it's perfect. We wanted to think a little more because when we especially think of uh, fetal growth restriction, but not only um, preeclampsia, uh, there are some studies done, which, which is this one, for example, the truffle study that you are seeing, the most famous one. They always show us what to do uh, when we have the diagnosis. For example, when do we end the pregnancy? When do we do the C-section? Uh, what kind of uh, parameters are needed or the screening? But about the pyramid or after the diagnosis as high risk, what do we do with these patients? This was not uh, before uh, thought, I think, or even implemented. So when we have the diagnosis, okay, we do give aspirin. But what happens then? This was a big question mark for me. And uh, that's why we started to think about it in detail. And in our unit and the university hospital, we decided to combine the whole this idea with the neonatological and psychological impacts as well. So we just didn't want to implement the screening and offering aspirin because, as I told you, it works. We wanted to combine it with the furthermore uh, concerns like when we do have preeclampsia or growth restriction, we have a baby which has a problem. And it should be thought as well because we, I do believe that we do need to think fetal neonatal way. That means that after delivering these children, uh, the problem is not solved. And what happens next is also very important. That's why we had our neonatal hypothesis. That means we do believe that a healthy growth is based on healthy development during the fetal, but also in neonatal period. And the health is determined by biophysical social factors. And the parents are therapeutic agents, which means that the psychological levels of the parents are also very important throughout this process. And many different risk factors affect the health. And these risk factors can be balanced by comprehensive care concepts. So our concept was this comprehensive care. And I do believe that uh, uh, we achieved this concept. I just want to show you two uh, short slides uh, and why the neonatology, uh, ne neonatal time is also very important. Here you see a study from our group uh, in the neonatal time that the frequency of neonatal hospital stays are dramatically higher if the birth weight is below 1,500 gram. And uh, we do believe as gynecologists that after delivery is fine, the baby needs to achieve a, a weight and then will be sent home. But it's not the case. Until first year of lifetime, there will be more than three hospital stays for the children when they were born below 1,500 grams because they do uh, offer some more health uh, problems in the following months and years. But there are also maternal consequences, as you know. For example, when we talk about the fetal growth restriction, we do have preeclampsia up to 12%, hypertension 10%, and we do end these pregnancies uh, uh, as doctors up to 20%. And these women, they do develop post-traumatic stress disorders. There are consequences for child, not just that they are small, but uh, they have bonding problems until 20%, metabolic syndrome 10%, and psychomotoric problems up to 20%. And what was the aim? We named our uh, concept the fetal neonatal path, and our first aim was the pregnant women with preeclampsia and fetal growth restrictions. So we want to prevent these pregnancy-induced complications, prevent fetal neonatal uh, growth restriction. We want to reduce the problems due to prematurity and the optimi optimization of the psychosocial conditions for the growth is very, very important. So how does it work? We have a system in Germany that the doctors uh, are also their primary doctors, uh, and that means there are some private offices that they belong to government, and uh, the pregnant women are having their follow-up uh, examinations every four weeks uh, through these colleagues. And they tell these women that they can have this path, and they are sent to the fetal medicine specialist that they do a first trimester screening, as I told you before. And if they have high risk, they are offered aspirin until 36 of pregnancy. 
But uh, as you see here in the path, it's in German, I know, but I will tell you in the following 12 minutes that uh, it will uh, 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 be, I think, more uh, possible to understand. Uh, as I told you, we just don't screen them, but we offer them a, a very uh, specific path to follow them up in our unit and other uh, clinics and also the units that they do our path with us and that means they come to us every four weeks that we check the Dopplers, the growth of the baby and the psychological status of the mother and they have psychological uh, meetings uh, with our psychologists and uh, we follow them up until the delivery with the hope that if they do uh, develop uh, preeclampsia or fetal growth restriction, we want them that they come to a tertiary center and uh, we know these patients and the children or the babies anyway, and they will be delivered in our hospital line unit. And that's not the only case. If the baby has the growth restriction as we supposed and we couldn't prevent it through aspirin, then the neonatologists, they, they offer a big comprehensive examination of these children and their pediatricians will be following up these children every four weeks until they are one year old. And the mother and the families will be psychologically followed up through our psychologist as well. Our time frame uh, is four years. We already started with this project. We did uh, receive almost 5 million euros uh, from the German government. And we want to use this uh, method in our region, which is the East Saxony in Germany, but we want to control it in each uh, East uh, Thuringia as well. And uh, we want to use our results and uh, compare it with the rest of the Saxony, with the women that they were not offered to have this uh, uh, chance. And uh, I'm involved with the doctors from the University of Jena. And uh, we, our primary outcome is the neonatal mortality and morbidity and we want to prevent the neonatal transfers which were not planned before. There are many, many secondary outcomes to check as well, like the family satisfaction, acceptance of this method, economical factors and preeclampsia rate. And I do believe I can uh, uh, report our results uh, in one week. Our interim results are very, very good. And the uptake of our path is also excellent. And I'm very happy that we can offer uh, the pregnant women this uh, path. We started in October 2019. We will include the pregnant women until end of September this year. The last baby will is accepted at the end of 2022, and we will be ending the project at the middle of 2023. We already included 421 women and delivered 179 of them, and postnatally 69 children are being followed up. 11 of them had preeclampsia and 231 were screened positive, which uh, uh, they accepted to take aspirin and the uptake is very, very good in our region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kahit, and uh, very good to see some uh, interesting and encouraging results in terms of outcomes and, uh, and follow-up. Um, we have a few questions that have been asked, and uh, we'll be taking those after our next presentation, which is uh, from uh, Baski Thiliganathan. Uh, Professor Baski Thiliganathan is the uh, Director of Fetal Medicine at St. George's Hospital in non London. He's a Fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and is also a former editor of the White Journal, uh, the uh, Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And Baski sits on a number of uh, policy-making bodies in obstetrics in the UK. He's a prolific author. Uh, his work focuses mainly on placental dysfunction. And Baski will talk about the implementation and effectiveness of early preeclampsia screening in his hospital in London. Uh, Baski, the platform is yours. Uh, Kevin, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you to Catherine and Thelma Fisher for inviting me to speak here today. Um, it gives me great pleasure, and I know that we have a short time, so I'll crack on. Um, uh, the, the previous speakers have, have given really kind of a masterclass in, in implementation of what we should be doing, but I really would like to tackle the elephant in the room. Uh, for the last 40 years, 
uh, we've been using, in one form or another, a checklist approach to assessing screen uh, screening for preeclampsia in pregnancy. Whether it's NICE in, in the UK and Europe, whether it's ACOG or whether it's the Australian guidelines, we have very similar checklists where we assess the risk of pregnancy based on high and moderate risk factors and then variable use of aspirin depending on whether a woman is high risk or not. And this has been the state of play for the last 40 years. And actually, you know, probably the audience here is quite educated and understands that it doesn't work. But there may be, well, people logging on afterwards who don't quite understand why what they've been doing for the last 40 years and whether it does or doesn't work. The reality of the situation is that it doesn't. Uh, this is by far the largest national-based data set. And it shows that preeclampsia year on year is increasing. There is no doubt uh, that the rates of preeclampsia are increasing, and, and particularly the most severe forms of preeclampsia. Is there any consequences of that? Of course there is. This is the trend in, in pregnancy-related mortality, and by far the vast majority of deaths in the United States are related to preeclampsia and or cardiovascular-related complications uh, to preeclampsia. So we've got to ask ourselves the question, why isn't the current screening system working? Why isn't that checklist, that very comprehensive checklist that we use, Working. For the first is that it's usually a legacy screening effect. Women have had to have preeclampsia or growth restriction to be put into the bundle of, of high risks. So just like Sohani said that in, in INSERM, they're using a policy of targeted screening for women who've had previous preeclampsia. Uh, that means that we're going to miss automatically 80% of preeclampsia cases because unless you've had it before, you're not going to be screened. Most of the risk factors we use, like age, obesity, etc., are really relatively low risk. They may increase your risk a little, but they don't make you high risk. And the fact that we've got so many factors uh, in this checklist means that we end up assigning high risk to 30 to 40 percent of women. And that can't be right. It can't be that 30 to 40 percent of women using a checklist are at high risk of placental disorders. And finally, there is an interaction risk. Uh, fallacy here, that we do not look at the interaction between the risks. So on the on the right here, you may be able to see, oh, it's not going to, yeah, you may be able to see on the left-hand side here that we may assign a 36-year-old woman with a family history of preeclampsia into a high-risk category. But then if she were Caucasian with a normal BMI, a non-smoker, had two previous perfectly normal weight babies without preeclampsia and had no other com comorbidities, would she really be high-risk? So that those interaction of risks are not, not taken into account. We only use the checklist to make women high risk. We never reduce their risks because of the absence of risk factors. And finally, the most important of all is that if you tell a woman she's high risk based on the checklist that you use, and she turns around to you and says, well, doctor, what is my, my risk of preeclampsia? You have to shrug your shoulders because the checklist doesn't give you any numerical assessment or any gradation of risk for the woman. So we've all heard about the FMF screening algorithm, and Leon has done, covered this in, in, in really quite comprehensive detail, as well as the subsequent speakers. I just put this slide up here just to make you aware of one factor here, which we're going to come and readdress later on. The combination of maternal factors with um, uh, blood pressure, uterine artery Doppler, and Pape in the bottom there has a 76% sensitivity for preterm preeclampsia, whereas use of PLGF has about an 82%. So there appears to be uh, about a 6% improvement in detection for preterm preeclampsia with the use of PLGF or PAPE. And that's what most of the retrospective studies ha have shown um, in, in the FMF and the Kipros's group. Uh, secondly, I think Leona did cover this, but aspirin use. And it is really quite perplexing why all the national bodies give such different recommendations. This is the first ever comprehensive randomized controlled trial for the if effect of aspirin in pregnancy, and that's done over 25 years ago, where they looked at a specific very high-risk group, and they used 150 milligrams of aspirin, and they demonstrated a significant decrease in preterm preeclampsia rate complications. Uh, for some reason or another, 21 out of the 23 subsequent studies, randomized controlled trials undertaken, have used lower doses of aspirin, principally 60 or 75 milligrams, without no rational explanation for why they deviated from the most effective study from Usan's group. And then unlike starting it at, at, at uh, three or four months of gestation, which was done in the original study, 20 out of 23 studies started the aspirin after 16 weeks of gestation, again, without any explanation. 
A possible explanation for why 150 milligrams is required is that in outside pregnancy, the use of 81 milligrams of aspirin is associated with a 30% aspirin resistance. Uh, and therefore, using dosages around 75, 40, 60, and 80 means that one third of you women that you're treating are probably not getting an adequate uh, aspirin dose. So we've heard about the FMF trial and we've heard about the efficacy, all right? And, and this is what the FMF trial showed, August of 2017, a publication, 26,000 women screened at 11 to 13 weeks, 3,000 of them allocated as high risk and about 2,000 accepted uh, randomization. Now, aspirin was given to 800 women and placebo was given to 824. On the right-hand side, you can see the effect. There was no significant effect in, in reduction of term preeclampsia. A 60% reduction of preterm preeclampsia occurring before 37 weeks. And although there was a, a, almost an 80% reduction of early preeclampsia, because of the low number of cases, this was not statistically significant. But it's fair to say that if the study had been larger and longer, they would have demonstrated this at a level of significance. There is a fundamental difference, however, in how we believe aspirin may work. It is often muted that aspirin is curative, and I would argue that that is not the case. This is a survival curve analysis from the FMF aspray study, and what you can see here is that actually there is a delay in the survival curve by about two to three weeks with the use of aspirin. So what aspirin does here is not cure preeclampsia, but delay the onset of preeclampsia such that women who previously may have developed preeclampsia at 34, 35, 36 weeks and be labeled preterm preeclampsia are now developing preeclampsia at 37, 38, 39 weeks. And therefore, it's occurring later at a term gestation when babies, in theory, should be doing a lot better. The difference between efficacy studies where a researcher has got millions of pounds and research fellows and midwives to help deliver this ideal circumstance care is very different from effectiveness. That means how do we, as clinicians, translate this into our routine clinics and, 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 and hospitals? And it's with that in mind that we introduced now, uh, over two and a half years ago, uh, routine first trimester uh, aspray or FMF screen for pre for preterm preeclampsia in our unit, a, a unit that looks after five and a half thousand women a year. So to date, about 12,500 women have been screened. Uh, in the UK, we had to go through the process of getting exemption from our national guidelines in order to be able to do this, to do something better. And we had a very pragmatic implementation. Uh, and what that means is that we don't have the staff space, time to be able to do things in such a rigorous and regimented manner as Leona wanted us to do. Uh, so we had to take very pragmatic decisions. We used PAPE instead of PLGF because women were already having PAPE for Down syndrome screening. So we said, we can do that. We don't have the money or the resources to do PLGF as well. We used aspirin, 150 milligrams. That was okay. And in our population, which is a South London, uh, high ethnic, low sociodemographic population with high comorbidities, we had to use a cutoff of one in 50 because that would confer to us about an 8 to 9% screen positive rate. When we used 1 in 100 or 1 in 150, we had much higher screen positive rates where we were telling 1 in every 10 women, uh, 1 in every um, 5 women that they were high risk of preeclampsia. So we made a pragmatic decision to use 1 in 50 so that we would have an acceptable screen positive rate. Again, blood pressure was taken at the time of the ultrasound scan and was done several times until we reached a nadir for both the systolic and diastolic blood pressure, according to the Australian guidelines. And that was usually reached on the third or fourth blood pressure measurement taken while the woman was semi-recumbent. And those were the factors that we put into the FMF algorithm to help assess the risk. Here on the left-hand side in red, you can see that if the risk was one in, a, one in 50 or above, they were given aspirin. And they entered a high surveillance pathway, which had at least two scans and the recommendation of induction of labor from 40 weeks of station. The low risk pathway had routine antenatal care. What did we show? What was the effect? And this is an assessment after about 5,000 women were screened, but the effect is true now with more than 10,000 women screened. Overall, we saw a 23% reduction in preeclampsia in our population altogether. However, one of the problems of doing this very crude analysis of saying what happened before 
And what happened after is that it fails to take into account trends and time trends in how things may have changed over time. So what we did was we did what's called an interrupted time series analysis. And what you can see in the pink is the rates of preterm preeclampsia in the preceding two years before we introduced FMF uh, screening. And you can see that the rate of preeclampsia was grand, preterm preeclampsia was gradually increasing from about 0.8 per thousand to about one, uh, uh, one per hundred cases. So there's a gradual increase. In yellow is the time period over which we introduced the screening and there was a time lag to the babies being born. And what you can see is once the screening was introduced with the use of aspirin, there was a persistent reduction and a continuing reduction of preterm preeclampsia with an 80% relative effect for the reduction of preterm preeclampsia. So we reduced preterm preeclampsia down to about um, four to five cases of preterm preeclampsia a year in a hospital during 5,000 women. That's incredible reduction in preterm preeclampsia. So much so that some of our research studies that focused on recruiting women preterm preeclampsia had to be halted because we simply did not get those women through the door. What was more important is that in the UK nationally, aspirin compliance in high risk pregnancy is very, very low, usually between 23 and 25%. In this population, there was a 99% compliance to aspirin prescriptions. So, what else were the factors? Now, did we, by delaying preeclampsia by two weeks, did we end up with having worse cases of preeclampsia delivering a term? And that did not seem to be the effect. If you look here, you can see that both the blood pressure use, abnormal bloods, magnesium sulfate were all pretty equivalent in all of the groups. But what we did see is a term reduction of preeclampsia by 22%, and that's principally because of the effect of delivering these women one week earlier. And that's demonstrated in the ARRIVE study. They showed about a 50% reduction in term preeclampsia by targeted delivery of women one week earlier. Um, did we have an impact on small for gestational age babies? Actually, contrary to the last speaker, there was really no reduction in, in the birth of babies below the third centile or below the fifth centile. So severe fetal growth restriction was not modified by the use of aspirin in this target group. We did, however, show a reduction in SGA babies below the 10th centile, but only at term. And again, I would argue that that effect is a consequence of targeted delivery of these high-risk groups between 39 and 40 weeks and not letting them go on to uh, 41, 42 weeks when the babies can become small. Kevin, I'd like to finish with this last slide to show uh, a, a, a nested cohort study within the 10,000 women we've seen already, where we took 1,000 women with 135 cases of preeclampsia, 30 of which were preterm preeclampsia, and we compared APE to PLGF. And unlike the previous published studies, we were surprised to find that we were not able to show a significant difference. And most possibly, that the lack of a significant difference between use of APE and PLGF may be because our study is underpowered. Only uh, 135 cases of preeclampsia. However, it is important to acknowledge that the retrospective studies uh, where PAPE cases were revealed may have resulted in targeted or sporadic use of aspirin by clinicians from referring hospitals. And now that we know the effect of aspirin on preterm preeclampsia, there may have been selective reduction of preeclampsia rates in the PAPE cases. And off note, in the prospective SPRE study, if we compare the mini combined tests using PAPE versus PLGF, actually there was no significant difference in the performance between the two. So I would argue with you that if you're looking for a pragmatic and easy way to introduce this test, don't let the fact that you don't have access to PLGF stop you. PAPE should be a route to us getting this done. So I'd like to finish by saying that screening using the FMA algorithm is feasible and effective in a public health setting with no additional money. There's a two-fold de-escalation of maternal risk with a two-fold increase in preterm frequency detection and almost complete physician compliance with aspirin prophylaxis. The outcomes resulted in a reduction of preterm preeclampsia by 80% and term preeclampsia by 22%. The clinical severity of the disease was unchanged and potentially reduced. And we also managed to effect a 40% reduction in small for gestational age beta term. I have to say that the continued use of a checklist for maternal risk factor preeclampsia screening in routine healthcare must be reevaluated. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Keith. Thank you very much for a very thought-provoking ending. Um, I'm sure in terms of some of our uh, UK legislative people, um, they will find the uh, outcome of your study really, really interesting. And uh, yes, it's about time we actually got on and started doing things rather than having lots and lots of discussions about how we might do it. Uh, it's, it's obvious from your data that uh, clearly we have enough information already to start doing the job properly. So uh, thank you very much, Baski. Uh, right, now we'll, uh, we're on to our... Uh, on to our Q&A session now. Um, just get up the correct slide. Um, thank you very much for all of you uh, who've uh, asked questions. Um, it's going to be a little bit complicated how to how to do all of this. And as I said, um, if we do have questions that um, we can't get answers to uh, uh, throughout the, the, the next session, then um, we will uh, be responding to those um, uh, by, by, by email uh, after the after the uh, finish of the um, of the webcast. Uh, so let me start by taking uh, uh, some of some some of the questions. Here's um, uh, <clears throat> had a question here from one of the participants. Uh, I'm not quite sure who it's to, but maybe it's to uh, Basky and to, to Leona and to uh, maybe to all four, four um, presenters. Is preeclampsia screening out of charge for women in your countries? Uh, I guess what they mean is, uh, is preeclampsia screening charged for, or is it part of, part of the, the state uh, um, healthcare um, provision? Would any of our speakers like to uh, respond to that question? Um, uh, Kevin, if, if, if I may, um, preclampsia spree screening and screening for placental dysfunction is part of routine health care. It's part of what we do when we see a woman and book her in early pregnancy. And that, that routine screening should be part of any health care package. The difference is that in some countries that health care package is paid for by the patient and others is paid for by the state. I work in a system where the state pays for that, so the woman should not have to pay for it. Safwan, do you have a comment from, from France? Well, the screening, uh, preclampsia screening in France, um, uh, at least in Toulouse, is doing uh, uh, under the, the umbrella of study, so it's not charged for, for women, but it's charged for our hospital. Okay, and Leona, is that, is that the same in uh, in Hong Kong? Okay, maybe we don't have Leona on board. Um, a question for, for Kahit. Um, how do you explain uh, the screen positive rate in your study is relatively high? Um, I would like to answer your first question first. The screening for preeclampsia is... Uh, um... Unfortunately, in Germany, not for free. Uh, it's not uh, in the screening program. And that was the main reason for us uh, to uh, run our study uh, because it's funded by the German government. It's called Innovation Fund. So we want to show that this is an innovative, innovative idea and all, every single pregnant woman should, must have the screening. And after the results, uh, the aim is that it will be a government-funded uh, screening, hopefully, in the next uh, following years. And I do believe that that will happen, but it works, unfortunately, very slow here. And uh, to answer your second uh, question, um, I do believe that the rate is quite high because we have a selected population at the moment. Uh, we have a good centralization, and that's the uh, difference in our state that uh, we are one of the two hospitals in a range of 160 kilometers and uh, all high-risk uh, women are being sent to us uh, anyway, apart from the screening. And that's why I do believe that we have a very high preeclampsia rate. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> this is a question to, to, to all of the speakers. Uh, 
The cutoff value at high risk seems to vary in different countries. Uh, how do we best determine the cutoff value? It's Leona here. Perhaps yeah. I can take this. Uh, okay. um, according to the ASPRE trial, we chose one in 100 because of the desired uh, false positive rate at 10%. And when we evaluated the data in Asia, it was more or less one in 100 as well. Uh, uh, for the fixed false positive rate around 10%. So I think it, it depends on what you want to achieve, um, whether you, you, you have a desired detection rate or whether you have a desired false positive rate. And But in our experience, I think um, in order to in increase the detection rate, you will need to shift, you will need to increase the false positive rate too. But if the false positive rate is too high, then the incremental benefit um, in, with the use of aspirin prophylaxis in preventing cases of preeclampsia that might be reduced. So I think it, it is a trade-off choosing um, the, 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 the appropriate false positive rate and, and, and for choosing that cutoff. But perhaps the others would have a different answer to, to mine. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's, uh, that's probably a, 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 a common demarcation that people um, uh, uh, in, in, in any in any center have to make that decision it's that trade-off and balance between uh, detection and, and false positive rate um, question from uh, Tabaski to what extent is uh, social cultural factors playing a role in preeclampsia <laughs> um, uh, so there are many factors playing a role in preeclampsia age height weight smoking etc and these are direct linked to both ethnicity and sociodemographic factors. Um, so they all play a part. What I tried to demonstrate at the beginning when I talked about the elephant in the room is that it is impossible for an individual to mix those factors up and to come up with a risk unless they use an algorithm. So you need to use an FMF, or if you have one that's better, an algorithm that puts all of these factors into the mix and produces the risk at the end of the day. And then you set a cutoff that is convenient to your healthcare resource setting in order to effect targeted aspirin use to reduce preterm preeclampsia. It's really quite simple. We're doing it already, but we're doing it badly. You just need a better screening tool so you can do it better. Thank you. Uh, another question to Leona. The uh, Aspray study has uh, been providing people with 150 milligrams of aspirin. The question is, is there enough evidence that 100 milligrams would work with similar results? And then what do you do about changing the aspirin dosage in women with a large BMI? Um, so to the first question, I mean, there is some evidence from meta-analyses suggesting that the minimum dosage required for effective um, prevention of preeclampsia is 100 milligrams. So but there is a dose response uh, in relation to, to the use of aspirin. So uh, yes, I, I would say that 100 milligrams it would be the starting point, but uh, based on our data uh, derived from, from the best uh, available trial, uh, I think 150 milligrams would achieve a better uh, effect uh, in terms of uh, reducing the, the rate of pre and preeclampsia. And the second point relates to, oh, I forgot, Sorry, can you repeat that, Kevin? <laughs> uh, what was the question? Yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> I've lost the Ask. question there. Uh, oh, yo, oh, 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 yes, uh, women with high BMI. So, um, oh, yeah, sorry, so yeah. I think yeah. that's a that's a very good question, and I I, I certainly know that in 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 Australia, um, John Hyatt certainly gives. 300 milligrams to very obese women because, um, you know, uh, the, the, the effect of aspirin is certainly dependent on maternal weight. And, uh, and uh, I'm often asked whether we should really titrate the dosage according to weight. But then uh, within the aspirin trial, it was a pragmatic trial. So we decided to use a single dosage. And um, But I think for very obese women, then one might have to consider a high dosage. But I don't have this particular experience because in Asia, our women uh, are, are, well, tend not to be too obese. Yeah, yeah, sure. I don't know whether the yeah. other other speakers would have uh, uh, a similar experience, a relevant experience. Um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, we've been using it now for almost three years uh, and over 10,000 patients. And um, really, uh, we've never had to use an increased dose and it seems to be effective. Uh, we have used smaller doses in women who are extremely small. So if they're below um, 45 kgs, then we tend to decrease the dose. Thank you. Um, question to Kahit uh, in, initially, but maybe uh, maybe to Baski and Leona too, is uh, what is the recommendation for screening in twin pregnancies? Can you screen for preeclampsia? So I'm following the uh, publications from FMF London, uh, but uh, I do believe that it's quite early. Uh, to offer it to twin pregnancies, and I hope that will be a randomized study uh, soon uh, to be able to offer the twin pregnancies as well. But I don't, uh, I, we don't offer it in our unit uh, since uh, I do believe that we need some more data for that. Um, may I answer as well, Kevin? Yeah, yeah sure, yes. Yeah, no, I don't think you should screen uh, twin pregnancies. I think they should all be given 150 milligrams of aspirin if it's safe. Uh, there's a commonly accepted fallacy that the risk of preeclampsia is only two to threefold higher in twins, and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, if at any gestation age, the risk of uh, preeclampsia in twins is 10 to 20 fold higher than in singleton pregnancy. Um, so we've underestimated it dramatically. So twin pregnancy in itself is a unique single factor that requires uh, aspirin use just in the same way that someone who has chronic hypertension when they become pregnant should be given aspirin as well, even though we can't be sure it works. The size of trials you need to demonstrate efficacy will be huge and will not finish them in time. I think it's a safe trial. In our, uh, yep. yeah. mm -hmm. in our, in our practice, we, we, do, um, we do exactly what Vasquez just mentioned, uh, we routinely give aspirin 160 milligrams to all our twins pregnancy. I mean, using screening uh, is possible, um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in order to achieve a very high detection rate of uh, near 100%, you also have a screen poster rate of near 70%. So, in my, it, I, I, so I think that defeats the purpose of screening. And I think, yeah, twinning itself is, is a major risk factor for preeclampsia. Okay, uh, another question to Leona. Um, could we give aspirin to women with a retroplacental hematoma and a high risk of preeclampsia? Oh, very good question. Um, if a woman has a high risk result based on our screening, yes. And if a woman has a retroplacental clot, and I think there is uh, more reason to give her uh, aspirin because, um, you know, um, that is a major risk factor for uh, impact presentation and the risk of uh, preterm birth and, and preeclampsia. So I, I think, I, I personally do not think that aspirin increases the risk of bleeding. But of course, if a woman presents with PV spotting and that and with the use of aspirin, that that might worsen uh, the degree of, of bleeding. But I, I think, yeah, definitely, uh, if a patient has high risk results together with a retroplacental clot, I would definitely recommend uh, aspirin prophylaxis. Okay, another practical question really has come in uh, uh, from uh, Natasha Toll. Uh, Natasha is asking the question: uh, They only have uh, tablets of 100 milligrams of aspirin in their unit. Uh, would you suggest giving uh, 200 milligrams uh, every every second day? Uh, or would you uh, advise giving one and a half tablets? I think the question is more around practicality of how, how do you manage mm. if you can only get a 100 milligram tablet as opposed to 150 or 200 tablets? Yeah, that is a tricky question because it depends on what kind of tablet Natasha has. If it's like an enteric coated, uh, well, you know, or it's a capsule because some 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 places have capsules and that would be impossible to half. But if if the pharmacy is able to half the tablet for the patient, I mean that is possible. But bearing in mind, at least in my part of the world, once I half the tablet and once the ingredients 
are exposed to water, then the tablet is absolutely useless. So if I were to give one and a half tablet, then the other half would have to be discarded. I wouldn't give 200 milligrams. Yeah. Okay. Um, question maybe to, to Baski and to, uh, to Leona and maybe Kahit. Um, what is your suggestion on which parameter to start with uh, in terms of screening in a low resource hospital setting? I'll answer that. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I work in a low resource health setting. Um, the, government, <laughs> the government funding to look after a woman's entire pregnancy is around £1,200 uh, per woman, and that's to look after all the antenatal care, all the scans, uh, supervise her birth, uh, look after her after birth, and send her home. So I would consider that a low resource setting given the cost of medical care in the UK. Um, if you're doing scans already, then you should be able to do uterine artery. Aspirin is not a major health cost. Uh, you already take blood pressure, so that's available. And I presume you talk to your patient, so you get all the maternal characteristics. Uh, the only thing is whether you do pap screening or not. So if you work in a country where screening for um, Down syndrome is not acceptable for religious, cultural, moral, or governmental reasons, then you may not have access to pap or that would be a resource cost. But everything else that's undertaken, I believe, is available in most healthcare settings, whether the resource is high or low. Uh, so you should be able to effect good screening. You just have to reorganize. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, question here from a couple of um, a couple of participants, uh, mainly asking the question that. Some doctors have said, what if we conduct the preeclampsia screening? We've got no treatment protocol. We have no treatment protocol other than aspirin. Um, what really do you think about that? Um, I think the, the answer is uh, clearly the studies that are coming out, uh, both uh, all, of the, all of the presentations we've had today are clearly indicating that, yes, uh, aspirin has a significant impact in terms of uh, targeting those that are at high risk, uh, and uh, th that then results in uh, reduced incidence of, uh, of, of the disease and the um, comorbidities associated with that. So I think um, the, qu the question really, if the, present if, if the person asking the question had listened to the presentations, then that would have answered itself. Um, to again to Leona, uh, some doctors say preeclampsia screening is not worth uh, as doctors are giving aspirin as a prophylaxis anyway. Um, wh what do you think of that sort of argument? Thank you. Um, is a very controversial topic. I think universal aspirin is is obviously very attractive because it's cheap, is supposedly safe. And if I give millions of pregnant women 150 milligrams of aspirin from 12 weeks till 36 weeks of gestation, I, I, I don't know what the consequences will be. Uh, I certainly wouldn't see, uh, I would certainly start seeing a lot of complications such as, you know, upper GI bleed, intracranial bleed, as we have observed in non-pregnant populations, you know, giving low risk patients for cardiovascular diseases, aspirin actually increase, increases the risk of adverse outcomes and not actually achieving the desired prevention. So I think we have to be cautious because we haven't really seen any randomized controlled trials demonstrating that universal aspirin versus nothing is really beneficial. So I think, uh, you know, it, it's the same argument that they are asking us to do this trial and we have done this trial and yet, you know, uh, as Ask is mentioned, I mean, screening isn't that complex. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of changing your mindset and, and, and uh, you know, reorganization uh, of, of what is what services are available and making it happen. And, um, and I, I, we're not pushing for doing the full combined test. I think a variation of a combined test is, is very good to start with. Um, and and I, certainly I haven't seen data suggesting that universal aspirin is, uh, uh, you know, uh, beneficial for the prevention of preeclampsia. 
Thank you, Dana. Uh, Kahit, there's a question here for you. If uh, you try and PI is difficult to implement in the country, what would be the recommended screening approach? Would biomarkers and MAP be sufficient, sufficient compared to maternal factors? I would uh, answer it by repeating what uh, Basque just said. Uh, if uh, the possibilities are not there to check for PAPE, for example, or PLGF, of, or in the country or in that unit, it's not possible to finance an uh, uh, ultrasound machine, then uh, we should use all what we have in the hand. And, uh, uh, and uh, it won't be a screening as it's... Uh, uh, preferred maybe, but whatever we have as tools in the hand, we need to use them starting with the history of the patient and adding the more uh, uh, useful markers just by measuring the blood pressure, for example. It's very, very important when we talk about preeclampsia, we do talk about high blood pressure and uh, we should start with that. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that's... Uh... That's pretty much we've got uh, pretty much towards the end of our time in terms of uh, questions and answers. We'll go through all the uh, questions, as I said, and make sure that we have provided answers. And if there are any that are left, uh, we will uh, uh, be responding to those by by, by email. So uh, really, it's. Um, it's coming to the stage of uh, uh, closing all of our events for today. I'd just like to uh, say a few words of thanks uh, to all of our speakers on the participants' behalf. I uh, thank you for your contributions to both the presentations and the Q&A sessions. Uh, always sticking to time makes the chairman's job uh, that much easier. And it, uh, even though we're working, for, for some of us working with uh, with new technology, uh, that job has been made easier by uh, you keeping to time. So thank you very much, uh, speakers. Um, to our participants, of which I believe there's more than uh, 1,300 people taking part in this webinar today, uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope you have found this session useful um, and relevant to your individual practice. Um, to the PNS marketing team at Thermo, uh, uh, then again, thanks uh, for organizing this event. And to the senior managers of Thermo, uh, thanks again for your continued support over many years in supporting our educational program and efforts. So to everyone, uh, I wish you all and your families a safe 2021. And I hope in 2022, we'll once again be able to meet in Berlin. So goodbye and thank you very much.